All right, so welcome back to uh, our panel. Please take your seats. And uh, I just want to, for a second, just thank Bob again for his brilliant presentation. Um, I, he addressed so many of the things that we're going to talk here in our panel called the Creative Spark of Steam. Um, before we get started, uh, I want to thank our panel sponsor, Cam's Whitmark Music Library, and the online ticketing software provider, Seat Yourself, for sponsoring the panel. So please round of applause. Uh, and again, if we have virtual attendees, though I cannot see them, they are a ghost, uh, we welcome them as well. So you have already met two of our panelists. Uh, Bob and uh, Teddy, Ron, on the end. Uh, in the middle, we have a new panelist, and I would like to introduce her. Uh, she is Lucinda Presley, founder, chair, and executive director of the Innovation Collaborative, a nonprofit organization that identifies and disseminates information about the many ways that effective integration of the sciences, the arts, and humanities engineering, and the use of technology reinforces teaching and incorporates lifelong learning in both in-school and out-of-school settings. You can find out more about the collaborative by attending Lucinda's workshop this afternoon at two o'clock. That's defining intersections this afternoon. And I wanna add one more thing before we get started. Um, you might note we have an empty chair on the end. Um, that's to acknowledge the visionary uh, researcher, Dr. James Catterall, who was to be our fourth panelist. He passed away unexpectedly August 23rd. It's a tremendous loss for his family, his team at the Center for the Research on Creativity, and all of his many collaborators and friends in arts education. Writing in the STEAM Journal, Dr. Catterall said this. The revisionist delegation has sidled up to STEM. Here were educators convinced that the arts had a legitimate place in science and technology education. The point was not that you couldn't teach physics and mathematics without the arts, but that artistic expression and principles could assist learners in structuring and organizing ideas, exploring disciplinary and cross disciplinary connections, and solving scientific problems. Thank you, Dr. Catterall. So with that, I would like to ask each of the panelists to give a brief introductory statement about their perspective and work around STEAM-based education. And Lucinda, as you're, as you're a newbie, perhaps you would like to start before we move into some other questions. My focus in my work. Listen my, my focus in my work is really looking at how these important intersections promote creative and innovative thinking skills in our kids. So teaching our kids to think as we deliver the content. The content's really important, but we need to develop an innovative workforce that these kids are going to be a few years from now. So in the collaboratives work, which is Jim EDTA is an important part of it, we are researching what are the effective practices that promote these thinking skills. In my work, in my own institution, I work with NASA and several other national partners, and we're doing the same thing, researching how do we promote these skills, especially as we teach science, using art strategies, not only the a visual art, but especially theater arts. And then in my work as a college instructor, I do the same thing with my art students. So um, it's all about learning to think. And I work with Sandy Chapman, who's one of another, Bob is one of the collaborative's research thought leaders. And a neuroscientist has shown that by intersecting disciplines and using them to solve a problem, students and we are creating important neuronal connections. So that's my passion. Hi, um, most of you met me yesterday. I'm Patty Ron, and uh, I guess what I'm particularly interested in, I've always felt that theater was the ultimate education, um, and I appreciate getting 
validation of that at the end of Bob's talk today. Um, but I, I'm interested in real collaboration and um, rather than thinking about any discrete disciplines, uh, thinking about how we actually each might transcend disciplinary boundaries and find ways to all become um, fully developed human beings because I think the problems of the current world and certainly the future world have everything to do with um, using our whole selves and our whole communities um, to address those problems. And I think any disciplines are um, antithetical to real collaboration. So Bob, we, we heard so much from you, but I would still ask you perhaps to give the briefest of statements. You can tell a joke if you want, but. <laughs> so, uh, I'll just tell you really briefly about my latest book, um, which is on artists, um, musicians, and performers as scientists and inventors. Uh, so real skeptics of STEAM have said, you know, do these, if these tools are so important, why aren't we seeing artists you know, contributing to the sciences and engineering and so forth. Well, they have been. Uh, I've been able to find about 120 really fundamental scientific or discoveries or inventions. Um, I'll just give you a really easy example to remember. Uh, if you were to take out your cell phone and look at it, the way that you are all able to use your cell phone simultaneously in this room and to do so in a way that no one can listen in on you except maybe the NSA uh, <laughs> is because of three people, basically, all of whom were in the arts. One's a collaboration between Hedy Lamarr and George Antio, Hedy Lamarr being the actress, George Antio being one of the most radical uh, 1920s, 1930s um, composers. Uh, and the other is the work of Joseph Schillinger, uh, who trained virtually every major um, jazz musician for, you know, during the 1930s and 40s. He developed a whole theory of the mathematical basis of the arts and music, uh, and there's, he actually has a book called that. Uh, the insights that these two sets of people had basically form the actual encryption algorithms which are used to allow you to do all your communicating. You haven't heard of this, probably because the scientists and engineers, when they take the information, just sort of strip away. It's very embarrassing for them to admit that they didn't invent it. And so what I've been trying to do is to reconstruct a lot of these fundamental discoveries and uh, bring them out in a book and say, you know, the arts are valuable. Artists and performers and musicians doing what they do best, the way they do it, make really fundamental contributions to our understanding of the world. So, Thank you. So let's dive a little closer into this fundamental question about STEAM education. How does STEAM education really nurture creativity, imagination, and innovation? Bob, you touched on this in so many different ways, but I'd like to hear from, from Patty and Lucinda about their perspectives. Uh, I think that any time any of us are exposed to something new, it's exactly as Bob talked about in his uh, great talk this morning, um, we start to see places that lines that we didn't uh, understand as intersecting are intersecting, and then there is, in fact, innovation. And I think that happens when any, uh, when any two ideas meet and are explored mm, deeply enough to find the intersection. Um, we just happen to be really good at it because we've got a lot of very unusual people intersecting. Uh, so I, th I think that we could be the uh, area that um, this kind of innovation and creative uh, work is, um, is home for a lot of uh, disparate kinds of people. And we're studying it in the Innovation Collaborative, the DC group that Bob and Jim and now Patty are a part of. We um, are, have a formal K-12 study and we're in year four and I brought up some of the findings from our classroom study which involved science and arts and humanities teachers last spring. One of the findings was the, the teachers implemented lessons that were using these intersections and we looked at attitudes but we did a great deal of qualitative analysis. So, 
because there are not many instruments that capture, and I know you all see the richness of, of the thinking and the, the content understanding when the kids are operating at these intersections. But we saw a 15.2%, which is small, but it was amazing um, given the students we were working with, increase in the interest in the interest in school, in the interest in STEM. These are from arts kids because most of the teachers implementing this were arts teachers. We also asked the kids at the end of this, at the end of their attitudinal survey, what is creative thinking? And the kids I worked with, this was a very low SES school. You can really relate, very low SES school, the end of May, it was after testing. So the kids' engagement was pretty um, minimal. What we found, though, in using these intersections to do inventions, these were to solve a problem on Mars, were that the kids were unbelievably innovative and creative. And we asked them, what is creative thinking? And a lot of the, a lot of the descriptions we got were actually almost textbook descriptions of creative thinking, such as creative thinking is being able to take ideas and change it into something else. It's where math, reading, science, and art are combined and you can make something out of it. Where you think of something no one else has ever thought of and create that thought. When you put two completely different things together. These are fifth graders. So we're seeing the richness of these thinking skills we want and we are developing, with Bob's help, we're developing instruments that can capture this, then that funders, school administrators, <laughs> district personnel, and even the STEAM caucus in Congress can present to really help us move the education field forward. Yeah. Actually, it takes me right to our, our next question, which is, and this is a sort of policy political question in its way. You know, there's a lot of discussion around STEAM education. Um, you know, it's actually embedded in the Every Student Succeeds Act. Opportunities to uh, realize a well-rounded education include um, a teaching and learning in STEAM. So how does it seem that the arts truly fit into the STEAM movement in a very, you know, practical and political way? Thoughts? I, uh, the, the things that are in my mind right now are about what the, what the sciences and mathematics and engineering can actually bring to the arts. I think quite often we are, um, we're, we're thinking, well, why should we give up the intrinsic value of our discipline to be serving instrumentally in these other disciplines? But I think, um, yeah, we got some applause on that. <laughs> Um, I think both can be achieved, that we can um, understand our work uh, in much more complex ways um, by intersecting with all folks from not just science, technology, engineering, and math, but, um, but all sectors, uh, you know, policy folks. And, um, and I think we just need to reach out across boundaries because we know that we can be instrumentally valuable to other disciplines, but I also think, just really selfishly, they can be instrumentally valuable to us. This is where you all come in. You all are the, the critical component to this movement. It's not gonna happen unless arts educators really are able to help us show the importance of the arts. And the arts not only are critical, it's the thinking skills that you all deliver that no one else can. I came from the arts world originally, but have lived in the STEM, STEM world for about 13 years. And what's amazing is that the STEM world is now beginning to be very, very interested in these skills because they're going to deliver the workforce that we need. But it's up to us as arts professionals to develop the the anecdotal information, develop the data that tells these guys who like numbers or like some qualitative anecdotal information that this is the most important part of this movement. Uh, can I just interrupt here? Um, I, I, I would also like to say that the fastest growing job sector in the 
northeast is creative technologies. So it's not that science and mathematics are going to necessarily always deliver the job force that we need. I think we will also deliver the job force that we need. Yeah, I, I think part of the problem is simply um, needing to address what the policy makers are thinking. In many cases, we don't know what that is. Uh, I keep trying to get people to go out and actually fund a study where we can go to all of our senators and congressmen and say, why are you not supporting the arts so that we can address those things? Informally, we've done some of this. Some of it comes down to very basic things like, if I've got a limited budget, what am I going to cut? You know, what am I going to fund? Um, so uh, part of our research over the last few years has been doing a series of large-scale studies looking at uh, who actually founds new companies, um, who files new patents and so forth. Um, it's just like the data I showed you on the Nobel Prize winners. It turns out that the people who are actually filing the patents, the people who are actually founding new companies, are almost always engaged in the arts from kindergarten all the way through their professional lives. Um, and they're very explicit about the fact that the arts are where they're getting their creativity from. Um, so, you know, that, that's part of what we need to do is figure out how can we address issues like budgets? How can we address issues like if there's limited time, how do you do this uh, in the most effective way? Uh, again, one of the things that I've been pushing uh, as a policy is we have to stop dividing all the uh, subjects into different disciplines. That's very easy for a specialist to deliver. Uh, imagine if you were to try to deliver a theater production, if the, if the lighting people only did lighting and actually never interacted with anybody else. The musicians never practiced with the performers. The performers uh, didn't know that there was going to be music. And, you know, I mean, this is the way we are educating our kids. The math is separate from the physics, is separate from the biology, is separate from the English. Is separate. My students in science can't read well enough to learn the language. You learn more new vocabulary in a science class than you do in a foreign language class. They don't know how to learn language because their language la learning isn't any good either. I mean, so all of this has to be put back together. And you people already put it together. You already know that you have to have all this integrated. Everybody has to know what everybody else is doing. That's the model we should be moving back towards. I'm, I'm, good, 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 I know, good. This is really important, and again, where you come in. In the collaborative, we work with the STEAM caucus in Congress, which is a bipartisan caucus focusing on integrating the arts with STEM in the in education and they were help it, responsible for helping pass the ESSA Act that included strong arts presence. They're now up to about 88 members and we have uh, some of our teachers that are working with us that have talked to their congressmen and asked them to please join this caucus to support the importance of the arts because there is an arts caucus but this is the arts and STEM and so this caucus is becoming very influential so you as a person, find out who your congressman or congresswoman is, find out who your senator is, make them aware of this caucus and let them know what a difference they can make for your students by being a part of the caucus. Yeah, I would only add to that, uh, many of you participated in our Arts Advocacy Day and um, one of our asks was focused around uh, full funding of Title IV Part A, which articulates um, funds uh, for uh, meeting the well-rounded needs in all subject areas. And it is, there's some siloization going on there, uh, and I like Bob's point, let's break that down and, and advocate for all of them uh, in an integrated way. However, um, there is the opportunity to gain funds that are specifically dedicated to professional development uh, that in some cases, let's say, would allow you to become better prepared and informed uh, teachers of STEAM-based education. Attitude. Oh, there. So let's talk about theater a little bit. How actually in a very specific way is theater realized uh, in uh, individual areas of STEAM? And, you know, interestingly, you know, 
I wanted to bring up an example of what knowledge does a student need to have of um, color in order to do lighting. And Bob, you so wonderfully brought up your example of the um, pants and shirt and uh, ghosting. So could we just you know, address some specifics? And I'm sure people in the audience might have some ideas as well. Go ahead. So in uh, what I work, I work with a lot with light and color from, and from a visual art and uh, theater looking at, uh, and science, looking at how do these colors impact your perception. And what uh, it really um, would help theater production to be aware of is how the use of color not only impacts what happens on your retina, but how your brain perceives emotion. So color is very, as you know, is very emotion related not only the lighting or how you mix colors in light because mixing colors in light is very different than mixing colors in pigment and what happens we'll do this at this afternoon in, in my session what happens when you mix all the colors in light and then interrupt that light can you use that as part of your dramatic presentation also when you have actors in different colors on stage that's going to impact what the audience pays attention to or not so um, light and color is instrumental in a dramatic production. I can talk a little bit, uh, having spent years as a, a, a theater administrator, that um, if we don't know physics, um, we don't produce good health and safety results. <laughs> uh, if we're going to build a staircase, we have to understand the physics of, of that assembly. And I think uh, that's just a really tangible, Bob talked about stage combat. Almost everything we do uh, is connected to, to physics. Um, and it's, we, it's up to us to articulate that uh, and not just say, well, we're just, we're, we just build things. Um, it's, it's easy for us to diminish the complexity of what we do. And, and usually I think simplifying is the answer, but sometimes uh, in this world, making it clear that we are doing very complicated processes is, um, is the way to go. Yeah, I, mean, I would say that virtually any special effect you're doing in, in any kind, I mean, you, you have the, the steam bubbling out of something, you have smoke going across. I mean, this is all chemistry, just to add in another, you know, another area. Um, and you can kill people if you do it wrong. You mix the wrong chemicals, you can have real problems. Um, there are ways of making smoke, and actually Hollywood took many years. Some of those things that the actors inhaled that they were putting in smoke weren't good for them, but they didn't actually know that at the time. Um, all this is knowledge that you can use to get your kids from their perspective, because they have a real problem, they need to produce something, they're interested in doing this, uh, to now learn the chemistry, and then your chemistry teacher can work off of that knowledge. You know, it's, it's just, a br again, a bridge. You find something that's a natural way of getting them to want to know something, and then push it from there. There are also, I think, all kinds of questions around neuroscience that I think acting will be involved in over the next several years. Uh, one of the questions that I want somebody to answer is when an actor is living a role, is it the same as if they weren't um, living a role but living their lives? Uh, I I'm interested to see the, the lights of the, uh, uh, of the neuroscience things on that one, the studies of the brain. So the neuroscientist we work, can you hear me okay? So the neuroscientist we work with out of UT Dallas has a huge uh, brain health institute with about 400 scientists that are all different kinds of scientists and uh, physicians and technologists that are looking at what's happening in the brain. And they have done research, extensive research on middle school students because they say the adolescent brain is where the changes really become permanent. And what the, the strategies they're giving us as educators, and this is where theater comes in, is that when you, uh, there are three steps to get the students to first um, strategically attend to information. So if, if you have a, a dramatic plot, what are the most important parts of that? So getting to the gist. And then synthesizing. So if they're synthesizing the, the lighting and the physics and the, the, the theater components, then they take that to solve a problem. 
for us and for them, they're actually creating actual neuronal connections in their frontal lobe. And from seventh grade up, those connections are permanent for us too. So those strategies are really important. And, and the head of the institute, who's a part of our collaborative, Sandy Chapman, says that the arts are very, very important part of this synthesis. I just want to add another part that I think is really fascinating is the science of storytelling. Um, you all probably know the research that suggests if I tell you a vivid story with vivid sensory details, the, your brain lights up in the same places that my brain lights up. It's as if you are literally experiencing that with me. Um, and so Bob's story about meeting his wife in Paris I had a physical Im impact experience as he was telling the details of that. <laughs> that actually, somewhat related to that is, is the fact that there are now a series of studies, actually National Institutes of Health just collaborated with uh, National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, they've just come out with a study that shows that people who continue to be involved with the arts over their lifetime age much more successfully. They're much healthier for a much longer time than people who don't. Uh, this corroborates studies that have been already done in Europe, uh, in Finland, and, and places like that. So uh, there's something about the sociality of you know, being engaged in the arts and using your brain in creative ways and so forth that's going to allow us to actually age a, much better as, as our lifespan extends. And one of the things that we found in our studies of scientists is this depends on what you get in school. Um, people who are introduced to, to the arts in elementary school uh, are much more likely to continue doing arts through their schooling, as long as they have access to it, and to then do it as an adult. It's much harder for people to get into the arts say in college or after they've graduated or whatever, um, the probability that they're going to get involved with arts and stick with it is, is almost nil. So we need, just for health reasons as well as creativity reasons as well, I mean the list is huge, we need to make arts a central part of everybody's education from the very beginning for almost every reason you can imagine. And why our policymakers haven't figured this out is, beyond me. That is a question that I wish we could all answer today, but <laughs> we probably won't. But here's a question. This is a question actually for you, Lucinda, because this is kind of your territory. So how can theater educators incorporate effective practice, excuse me, effective practice thinking skills uh, into their classrooms and on their stages? Thank you. Yes. We've been studying this in classrooms, in arts and, and sciences classrooms. Um, for a couple of years, especially the study in the last spring showed us there's some specific thinking skills that bring this to bear. So one of the most important is involving them in pro problem-based learning. Give them a problem that they have to solve and they go through the steps, defining the problem, narrowing it down to making it doable within the, the materials or the constraints that they have. Also then generating lots of ideas but as they generate lots of ideas, being really aware of evaluating the ideas. How many of you all have students who, uh, when coming up with ideas, just throw stuff out whether it relates or not? They just like to be heard. Yeah. So given what's happening today, we need our students to really be able to evaluate information. That's an important skill. And as they're doing this, and we, we found that these skills, in this study, found that these skills do generate the creative and creative, um, innovative thinking that we need. Also, like Bob talked about, having them abstract, get to the big idea. And that's a, a, a neuroscience principle also. Comparing and contrasting, changing perspectives, being the, being the theater person, then putting on the science hat. And then, see, and then taking them both off and being both at the same time, but being able to look at things from different perspectives. Synthesizing, being able to put these ideas together seamlessly, um, and then being able to create. For you all, it's a dramatic production, but then responding is really important. Responding to others' productions, responding to your own, responding to another team's ideas, as you all work through the process and then um, brainstorm ideas together. These are the thinking skills that, that our 
expert, our experts like Bob and the other thought leaders and our, uh, all of the institutions involved in this helped identify at the beginning of this process and we're iterating still, but we're seeing that these are really strong thinking skills for your students to really use. So um, here's a little bit different question. You know, we talk a lot about neuroscience uh, and cognition and um, technical theater, but can theater address, or rather can theater, um, can theater address STEAM dramatically? And um, Patty, you sort of touched upon this through storytelling, so I'm gonna toss that one over to you first. Um, I guess I have an opinion about this. I, I don't have evidence, but it's uh, in, intuition that we can uh, address it directly if the storytelling is good. Um, certainly in productions in plays like The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime or Proof or many of these uh, uh, sciency stories, um, as long as the storytelling is strong, the dramaturgy is strong, then it's good. I, I have had a lot of experience with not so good uh, dramatic storytelling that I think it does both the science and the theater um, a disservice. So um, I, I, we have to depend on our, on our expertise in terms of um, curating those pieces. Just not everything that's about a science event is, is good theater. So that's uh, probably not very PC for me to say. <laughs> How many of you are involved with Science Olympiad? Anybody? Well, if you have Science Olympiad at your school, which you might, talk to your science teachers because one of the components of Science Olympiad is that the students have to get together and they actually have to do what Patty Ron's been talking about. They have to, as a group, collaborate to present, often as a dance, a musical, a, you know, something. It has to be very effective, whatever their science idea or invention was. Um, the kids who come out of these programs are highly sought by uh, colleges because they have a whole set of skills that the regular scientists students don't, including communication skills, collaborative skills, and things like that. Um, and major universities like MIT are learning this the hard way. So one of the first things I did about 20 years ago, 25 years ago when I started doing STEM to STEAM stuff was I got a call from the provost at MIT who said, I want you to come out and consult with us for a couple of days because we just found something very disturbing. We did a study of the Harvard graduates engineers and the MIT graduate um, uh, you know, engineers about 20 years out into their workforce. Um, you know, we expected, of course, that our MIT people would be outperforming the Harvard people because you know, we're a better school and we're much more focused on engineering and all that kind of stuff. Now, what we actually found was sort of the opposite. So the MIT engineers were just as good at engineers as the Harvard engineers, except that they all worked for the Harvard engineers. <laughs> so I so said, we're trying to figure out why uh, it became really clear really fast that the reason was that the MIT people got only technical training. The Harvard people went through an, a liberal arts training. That's, it's Harvard, it's liberal arts, right? So they had to take history uh, courses and writing courses and a lot of these kids were involved in theater or art or marching band or I mean what these things teach you all those skills that have to do with leadership and organizing people and communicating which the MIT people didn't get. So MIT had to change their curriculum to give their kids these skills. That's what Science Olympiad is doing for these kids. And at some level, it is theater. It's directly what you already do. You could be really beneficial to the science students uh, in making them see all the things that Patty's been talking about and actually apply these uh, on a you know, competitive basis and do a better job. And I have a way to practically um, give you some hints, too, for your practice. In K-12, I, I work with NASA on the Mars Project, have for years in K-12. And we have the kids uh, learn the science through the arts. 
and they have to invent, they have to solve a problem that NASA gives them. For example, fifth grade has to invent a, a machine that will provide sustainable water resources. Where you come in is helping them be able to communicate it. You could, you could contact your science teacher, ask what project they're working on, because when these kids in a science class come up with an invention or a solution to a problem, because many science STEM, STEM teachers are doing PBL, then they have, we make them defend it. So they have to write a defense like a real scientist. They have to write an explanation of their findings, why it works. But then we have them practice it dramatically so that they can engage the audience and help the audience understand better instead of just sitting up there reading. Uh, I, mean, I know you all have seen this where your kids just sit up there and read. So getting them to help an audience understand the science. So partnering with your STEM teacher or the science teacher would be really wonderful for you guys and for them. I don't want us to sound like we're saying, and then you should also do this, and you should also do this, and on top of your 14-hour work days, you should also do this. I think there may be creative ways for you to invite the other teachers in, in your uh, areas to come into your rehearsals or productions so they can help you identify. Um, it, it does sound like, we are actually the answer to everybody's problem. So, but we can't. We don't. We don't have time in the day to to, to meet those needs. So, I, I think that may be a really interesting question for future con future conferences: is how do we find efficiencies of time to do this kind of collaboration? Are there grants or fellowships that we could provide or or create? that would allow teachers to do collaborative work, um, buyouts for a semester or something like that. I think there are some, we, we need to think through the policy of time and money to provide you all with, um, not, uh, or cloning, that would, also be an, uh, that would also be an interesting scientific approach. Exactly right, Patty, perfect. I, I would also suggest that, sorry, I would also suggest that um, when you have problems, I was listening at breakfast this morning, some of you like have ancient electrical systems and lighting and so forth. Um, I would suggest you go to the science teachers and the sci even better, the science students and the classrooms and say, you know, we have this problem. We would really like to be able to. We have unbelievably bright kids. They don't look at things the way we do. They don't look at a budget. They don't look at. A, they just sort of go, "Oh, I know how to do that." That's why I take my computer problems to my ten-year-old, right? Because the ten-year-old already knows how to solve these things. Um, we need to enlist other people in our com communities to help us out by telling them what would make our theater productions work better. <laughs> Because I will bet that a lot of them would love to get engaged. Um, I would have loved to do things during you know, junior high school, high school. I didn't know that these things were even problems. I didn't know that there were opportunities. So um, they might actually be able to save you some of your, your work, um, give you solutions to problems you don't see how you can do. Um, do workarounds where it costs virtually nothing, but you know, a science teacher already has it, or somebody's dad has the stuff in their garage they're getting rid of, and you can use it. Um, let them be, you know, give them the challenge, let them see what they can do with it. And that's doing basically what Lucinda is doing formally. This is now informal. So um, I want to make sure we have a few minutes for Q&A. And um, in some ways, I'm going to put the first question out to which you guys have already basically addressed was, why would a science educator want to work with me? And uh, to be more blunt about it, what's in it for them? So I'll just start with that question, which you really have been talking about anyway. You want to just comment on that a little further, and then we'll open the floor up. Uh, I don't know if I have an answer to that particular question, but I will say that we used to give a, an award at Virginia Tech called Look Mom, I'm No Longer an Engineer. I'm very, very popular with the parents. Um, and, <laughs> um, because we can provide real hands-on engagement with problem solving for scientists and engineers, exactly as we were just discussing. Uh, they, get, they don't have the opportunity 
to um, apply the things they're learning in, in really exciting ways. And quite often, they are um, isolated and, um, you know, in need of a social life and a community and a tribe, just like we all are. Um, so I think the theater can give scientists and engineers and mathematicians uh, a, a, an interesting tribe and practical problems to solve. In K-12, it really, it would be extremely helpful since I've, see, I've seen a great deal. The science <coughs> teachers and on the test and a number of state tests they're tested on the process skills, observing, asking a question, experimenting, and then coming up with a solution. That's what you all do. And um, the teachers I work with aren't even aware that the theater arts department in their school could really, through the thinking skills you all deliver anyway, work together to give the students in STEM these thinking skills so that they, like Bob says, there's transfer that can happen that they could take these thinking skills out of one discipline and see that it applies to another. They're really struggling with this. So the, the problem solving and the process skills that you all innately deliver are exactly what they need. Yeah, and all of this, I think, is going to become very explicit. Around March next year, I'm going to make a prediction. Um, I've been involved with the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. They have been doing a two-year-long study uh, on whether, uh, this is specifically for undergraduate graduate, um, and professional training, whether students should have to have arts, crafts, um, design, so forth. Um, it really, really looks like they're going to say yes. Well, that's going to mean that students who already have these experiences coming into college are going to be a premium um, because they're going to be the ones who are actually going to be able to take care of, take advantage of uh, the arts in these college curricula. Um, it means that there's going to be a trickle down effect of you know graduate schools, medical schools, engineering schools saying we want this in the curriculum, we want students who can do this which means all the policymakers are going to have to sit down and go, hmm, if we want our students to get into the good colleges, maybe we need to put the arts back into our high schools and our you know, other secondary schools, maybe even push it down into our elementary schools. Um, so look out for next March. Look for the National Academy report. Um, I think they're going to really start transforming the way we look at all this and all the things that you're doing pretty much in isolation and without much reward, hopefully over the next few years are going to become much more highly valued. All right, so at that, um, we have a few minutes left and I'm gonna come down off my podium here. And uh, do we have questions? I hope. All right, Mr. Walker. I'm gonna come your direction. Let's not run into each other. Let's not. <laughs> Right. Okay. So, um, yeah, you have to follow my train of thought, which sometimes, you know, is derailed here. But uh, it seems to me that <clears throat> what we're talking about is the end product, right? We want the students to be well versed in STEAM, uh, creative thinking, and problem solving. Um, and if something cool is going to happen next March, I can't wait for it to happen because my birthday's in March, and so happy birthday to me. Thank you. Um, but. We're training teachers still in the antiquated model, right? So if the college is going to say we want these kids that are trained in the arts and creative thinking, but they're still training teachers to be in their closed classroom teaching mathematics, and I don't have a, it's not a question, it's not a solution, it's just an observation. It seems like the circle is not connecting here. It's almost like it's creating a spiral. I'm just going to put that out there. One thing we've talked about extensively is really looking at pre-service, pre-service professional development. So we, the collaborative has an NEA, another, this NEA grant we have is focusing on professional development. And we hope to take it, after we've tested it with classroom teachers, into some college classrooms. That's another grant, but that's definitely, you're exactly right. It's not going to happen until we, till we get to pre-service. Yeah, again, some of this is going to change um, because of the congressional um, committees. Money has now been put into NSF for new kinds of teacher training where they're going to have 
to have STEM people working with people in the arts. Um, there are whole sets of grants available. Some of the better universities have already cottoned on to this. Uh, Arizona State University, for example, has totally transformed their teacher training. Um, they've hired a whole bunch of people who are doing uh, integrative stuff, both with technology uh, and the arts and with sciences and the arts. Um, there are a couple new engineering colleges uh, which have uh, engineering education programs which have completely integrated arts uh, and design into their engineering curriculum. So all the students get it, including the people who are going to be uh, doing you know, engineering training or technology training in schools and so forth. Uh, so it's starting. Um, what looks like happening is that these programs are so successful that you know, everybody else is starting to scramble. Um, so, again, over the next 10 years, I, I really think there's going to be a huge change. 30 years ago, when I first started doing this and trying to talk about it, I couldn't find audiences to talk to. I couldn't find any money. There was no place to publish. Now I turn down two-thirds of the invitations I get to give talks. I can't keep up with all the stuff that's going on. There has been a sea change in how we look at STEM, STEAM, arts. It, it's slow, it probably hasn't impacted you yet, but from my perspective, it's a really, really huge change. May I ask? So the proof is in the pudding. I know so much of what is driven by our administrators is testing results. So will then PSAT and SAT follow that March you know, report, encouragement? So if James Catterall were here, I will I'm going to empathize and become James Catterall. Um, he's already done studies on the SATs. Um, kids who have arts, um, and the more arts they have, and the more music they have in high school, uh, basically it gives you a 200 point advantage on your SATs. That's a huge difference, okay? It's very, very significant. This is true whether you're in a good uh, school system, a bad school system, whether you're a minority, whether you're a woman, whether you're a man, I mean, it's across the board. Um, so some of that is already known. For whatever reasons, the arts have a huge impact on learning. I think some of it's just because of the things we've already talked about here. We're not doing it as well as we could, so a lot of the kids who are doing these impacts are putting it together for themselves, or they have one teacher who helps them imagine if we do this across everything. My contention has always been if this works, we can continue testing the way we've been testing and scores will go up because we're more effective. I think what we need to do is stop teaching to the tests because that's a total waste of time. And if you look at the school systems that are doing the best, they don't teach to the test. They do, they teach what is best for their kids and what they know works and the kids still do better. And I will give you the world's best school system, that's Finland. Finland has stopped teaching subjects and they don't do any general testing at all, okay? But on a per capita basis, they have more Nobel Prizes, they have more patents, they have anything you wanna measure, they have more than anybody else in the world. And their system has moved entirely to problem-based teaching and it is local. So the problem based, if you live in an area which the mayor, the major thing that you produce is, you know, wood products, all of your education is focused on wood related industries and, well, if you think about it, you still have to learn all the economics. If you're gonna do economics, you have to know math. If you're gonna know math, you have to also know statistics. If you're gonna, you know, <clears throat> you also have to know advertising, you have to understand supply chain, you have to understand sociology. You have to, a kid who sits down and looks at a problem of how something actually works in their neighborhood has to learn everything. Oh, amazing. And now they're ready to actually work in the workforce. Um, this is the best school system in the world. It's like theater every day. It's totally integrated, okay? And we're slow. We're eventually gonna figure this out because competitively, that's who's beating us right now. Um, we have to stop looking at China. We have to stop looking at Korea and Japan. Um, they actually are not innovative in any way whatsoever. I get invited over there all the time because they have the top scores in the world and they have no inventions and their workforce is completely 
unable to uh, innovate and so forth and so on, and they know it. Why are we mimicking them? I don't get it. I think colleges and universities are also moving away from SAT, ACT as uh, admissions, uh, as exclusive admissions requirements. So I, I think we're, we're moving in all kinds of good directions in that way. After many years of working at schools with little resources, I just started a new job at a school that has a lot of resources. And as I was being interviewed and interviewing them about what school I was heading into, one of their biggest things was we have a new innovation center. And they're so proud of it and they're touting it everywhere. And, and my ignorance was like, oh, perfect place for me. They need me. That's, I'm the creative person they just hired. And so I toured it and there was all technology. There was no place to think, there was no place to create, there was no system to create. Oh, look at, we can make these little drones, and look at, we can have this that can make this. And I was standing there going, where is the creativity that has to precede this technology? And as somebody who wants to go back and say, I can bring something to this new innovation center that is sorely needed, is there any courses or credentials or something that would give me credibility to say this is what you need that I could take now that's not going to be later in you know is there some summer program is there some courses is there something online that I can take to give my um, ideas to them more credibility uh, just a very practical thought uh, and that is that there is no question that innovation comes from collaboration Look at the Thomas Kilman conflict mode and see that assertiveness and cooperativeness are what are needed to achieve collaboration. And you can make your own argument in a paragraph that you are the kind of person with the kind of skills that are going to help people achieve collaborative rel relationships. For a lot of the thinking skills that, that they're going to need to be innovative the skills I've talked about previously, but additionally, if you wanted a course, if you look at the Buffalo State International Center for Cre Creative Studies, that's where creative problem solving started with Osborne and Parnes. They have online courses or they have blogs. There are things, if you look at what they're doing, that would really give you some information and a, a, a leg up. And the other thing I would do is try to motivate them by pointing out that, okay, I just made a drone, what do I do with it? What I do with it is all the things you do. You have to create a scenario and a script and a context and, and you know, that you play. <laughs> um, just making it doesn't teach you anything. And everybody in the technology world who's any good understands that the making is the easy part. It's, making something anybody wants to use and then using it appropriately, appropriately and effectively, that's all the stuff that you're thinking about. It's the human side. So once they make the thing, um, tell them they have to think about what you're going to do with it, who's going to use it, how you're going to use it, and that's where you come in. At that, um, we need to wrap up. I'd like to everybody to give a round of applause for our panelists. Thank you, please. And uh, maybe they'll hang around for a few minutes if you have an additional question. I did have a question uh, about where will we be able to access Bob's uh, PowerPoint and uh, through PayPal? No, kidding. Uh, no. No. Uh, we we will be putting this into the EDTA community to make it available to anybody who wants to access it. So thank you so much all for participating in our, our panel and uh, uh, have a great afternoon. And don't forget uh, Lucinda's uh, presentation this afternoon uh, at two o'clock if you, if you want to find out more about the Innovation Club.